Hyde Pride, Jeff Jefferson was specially bred to go down rabbit holes, but now comes out as a pigeon shooter. Yeah, yeah I'm 35, plus 16. Damn tourists, most of the year, most of the people enjoying themselves in our nation's national parks are hunting, shooting or fishing. In August, the day trippers take over, making deer stalking difficult, as Tom Davis explains. I had two occasions, people camping. The firm will pick that up. <laughs> um, it was weird to start with, couldn't make out what it was. We're going international. What's more horrific, a tiger attack, a leopard mauling, or an assault by a bear? An expert spells out the differences. When they attack, their attack is a form of digging. So they dig into the person, so it's, it's a ghastly, gory thing. Dan Bibb talks about 410s. Competition is for an Acumax Springer air gun. David is all over the news on the new stump. And James Marchington has the best hunting and shooting videos covered in Hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. That way. Should never be a field trials champion, you know. But I love her. <laughs> but that way. Mark yeah. Jaff Jefferson way. is usually yeah. head down digging for glory with the South Somerset ferreters. The left, the left, this morning, left. it's eyes to the sky doing what he loves best. Yes, this week's confession is that Jaff is a pigeon shooter in a ferreter's body. I mean, I do appreciate you coming down, Dave, really. Oh, yeah. you're a lovely man. Well, I mean, we saw two take off from the field, so, you know, high hopes. Yeah, let's just get on with it, shall we? <laughs> I had already warned David that Somerset is not famous for its pigeon numbers, and it would be a miracle if Jaff manages double figures. David, I apologise now. <laughs> no, you can't start like that. <laughs> we don't shoot any pigeons. We'll have a good day anyway. Yeah, um, it's, uh It's been really, really weird start to my pigeon shooting season this year. By now, I've norm normally shot well, a good few hundred pigeons, but this year, with the rain, the farmers can't cut the fields. It's just been one strange year for pigeons, you know. So how many have you shot? Not even 50. The harvest has been tricky this year for a lot of farmers, with crops taken when short windows of dry weather appear. All right. Jaff has chosen a stubble field with standing wheat behind us. I bought you a little chair. Very accommodating, I am. Does that lift you up? No, it just keeps my ass comfortable. Otherwise, there's a bar there, look. Oh, yeah, okay. And after an hour, it yeah. gets pretty uncomfortable. I think most people, they'll buy hide poles. I bought them in the past. They're a bit sort of flimsy. So I've had these, I've had these for years. It's just metal reinforcing bar. A friend of mine's a welder, so... Uh, don't know what happened to that one. He's a little bit bent, but... Um, yeah, yeah. They'll last forever, see? Yeah. Most pigeon shooters have developed their own hacks, stuff or tips they've acquired over the years to make life that little bit easier and their days out more successful. Crowman has his human organ transfer box to carry nets and decoys. Jaff has wobblers and an archive of wonderful tales of spending time with his grandfather. Wobblers. It's what they wrap bricks in to keep the bricks together on pallets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just a bit of um, threaded bar, look. I tell you what, slightest little breeze. Let's get a decoy out. Uh, let's go out in the field a bit. So, a... hopefully, there's enough breeze today just to make them slightest little bit, and it just gives that little bit of movement in the pattern, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't do every single, probably put maybe half a dozen of these out on wobblers. On really windy days, you can't use them because they, they fly off the, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So tell me about your creative grandfather then with his own homemade flapper. Oh, yeah, when I was seven or eight years old, when I started going out with him, um, he made the flapper, plastic decoy, probably very similar to this. Somehow he fixed it to a board with the wings and they had this contraption that he built underneath with springs everywhere and he had a, a bit of fishing line went from the board through some like staples to hold the fishing line down so if you imagine it came in there went up to these springs which were attached to the wings and I would sit in the hide and he'd just say right flap flap so I'd have to pull the string 
you know, and the wings would flap. And I'll tell you what, it's ingenious, really. So how long ago was that? That was Ooh. when, obviously, because you're probably 35. Yeah, yeah I'm 35, plus 16. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, that's got to be, well, I was seven or eight, what, 45 years ago, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Way before any sort of technology came out. Yeah, and another thing, me and my brother always laugh about this. If he put dead birds out in the pattern, he would insist we'd peel the eyelids back or pull the eyelids off the pigeons. What? Yeah. That was the way to... He thought that the pigeons up there could see down. This, yeah, this is what he was taught. And uh, yeah, peel the eyelids back so the eyes are open rather than closed. Yeah, believe it or not. Yeah. So he thinks they were clocking it yeah, to that yeah, level of yeah, detail. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he probably learnt from someone or, you know, it's... Yeah, I always remember doing it. Um, so do you still do it? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Like, lots of, lots of things. I mean, he would, he would sit so still, so still in the hide. You couldn't even scratch your nose and he'd tell you to sit still, you know. Yeah, um, I know the feeling. To be yeah. With everything crossed, Jaff, David and Poppy, mm. the keen as mustard springer, wait for it all to happen. <sighs> comfort. Home comfort. Where's my cushion? Got it. <laughs> Incredibly, Jaff starts the day with a double. We got two. <laughs> yeah. uh, welcome to Somerset, David. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is Hey. Right, that's it. We've started now. Yeah. I hope you got that. The pressure is off. We're going to do it. <laughs> Jaff is a semi-auto shooter and has always had Berettas. Nah, it's the Beretta A400 XL. I've still got my old semi-auto at home. That was a Ber uh, Beretta Silver Mallard 2, I think. Very nice silver gun. Silver Mallard 2. I'm sure it was a it's Silver Mallard. I'm sure it's it. called a Silver Mallard, yeah. Good girl. Come but on. you know what it's like? You have something for a while and you fancy something new, don't you? So I treated myself to uh, this about two and a half years ago. And the good thing is it's almost identical no. to my old one. So going from that one to this one, hardly any difference at all, you know. Um, I always use a free shot when I'm out pigeon shooting or rook shooting. Um, just for the fact that sometimes I need that third shot. Yeah, yeah some quite more often than not, to be honest. He's down. If anyone should be wearing hearing protection, it's Jaff. There are not many who would have given his or her ears such a pounding. I was in a band, played the drums for, yeah. <laughs> Rock star I was, mate, uh, for, I was going to say, 15, nearly 20 years. And that's loud, you know, never wore ear protection oh then. Yeah. Um, power tools at work. I can't hear the birds sing anymore. That's a lesson to any youngsters out there. Yeah, oh, definitely. Protect your ears, because i got continuous hissing in both ears. Tinnitus, you know. And uh, we've got an alarm on the fridge. If the fridge gets, the door gets left open, the alarm goes off. I can't hear it. Uh, Dad, shut the fridge. <laughs> I can't hear the alarm, see? I can't, but my best advice to any young shooter shots is protect them, because, yeah, you get to my age and you start missing out on stuff, you know? At the end of our afternoon in Somerset, we end up with 15 picked woodies. How are you finding Somerset, anyway? Beautiful. Is the air is the air breathable? Oh, it's definitely. You definitely. might go away with a bit of a funny accent, huh. but you'd be all right. The ones that don't end up on the Jefferson's what barbecue do, uh, will no dollar. doubt be used to feed Jaff's ferrets in readiness for his second favourite pastime, bolting rabbits into nets. Come on. To watch Jaff on the pigeons and the rabbits, head over to the South Somerset Ferreters YouTube channel. Come on. In. Thanks, Jaff. I think he's a natural ferreter. Now, we gave away a Danum Blades row catcher knife priced at £325 to Tucker234 who entered on YouTube. This week's competition is for an Acumax S1 Black Synthetic Air Gun from UK gun distributor ASI. You can win it by joining the Field Sports Nation and watching their special Tuesday night show, Field Sports Extra, link to that below. 
we need you as members. We're getting ever closer to the 6th of November 2023 and our court date with Chris Packham, who's suing us for defamation. Lots of you are responding amazingly generously. Thank you. We have a donations page and an auctions page, links below. We're adding new lots to the Poke Packham auctions page weekly, so please pass the link below around your friends. Latest to go up is a game shoot day and two deer stalking days on an estate in Suffolk, kindly donated by a member. The main push is to ask people to support us through membership. It's five pounds a month or 50 pounds for the year, and you still get a goodie box when you join. Next, stubble trouble of a different kind from David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The number of hen harriers in the country is at its highest for a century. The figures are in and it's been another record year for the hen harrier brood management scheme. 2023 saw 24 chicks released successfully, nearly double the 13 chicks last year, which was in itself a record breaking year. All this takes place on grouse moors and without the help of the RSPB, which withdrew from the scheme. And a huge well done needs to go to the partner organisations like the Moorland Association and Natural England. And Basque are really proud to be putting money into hen harrier conservation. It just shows what work the gamekeepers can do for hen harriers across the country and how vital we are. Revive has bumped Scottish Water into a statement on grouse shooting. The water company told the anti-shooting organisation that it plans to review its one grouse shooting lease when it comes up for renewal in 2027. It says it had no plans to grant new leases, though it did not reveal whether it had any more land suitable for grouse shooting. The news follows United Utilities, rowing back on its announcement it would ban grouse shooting on its estate by 2027. The English water company says it now plans to review, not ban, grouse shooting. You can help stop the Scottish Government abolish the close season for red and seeker stags. Under pressure from the conservation industry, the SNP Green-led government is proposing to remove the statutory closed season on male deer. This proposal will be considered by the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee, which will report its findings to the Scottish Parliament. Edward Mountain, MSP for Highlands and Islands Region, has lodged a motion to annul the proposal and has put up a petition link below. We are urging people to support the petition that has been published by Sir Edward Mountain, MSP. This can be found online and it's very easy, very simple to fill in. We need to stop this legislation. We need to look after the iconic deer in Scotland that have been managed so well for decades. A police force has cracked down on gun owners in a special operation. Acting on intelligence, Cumbria Constabulary carried out Operation Crosshair, visiting five addresses to conduct drug tests and check security. Certificate holders at three of the addresses passed drug tests. At one address, the certificate holder failed a drug wipe, which led to police seizing three shotguns and ammunition. At another address, the certificate holder passed the drug swipe, but was found to be in breach of the terms of the firearm certificate on multiple counts, including storing firearms insecurely. As a result, police seized firearms and shotguns. The proposed ban on trophy hunting imports into Britain has less than a 10% chance of becoming law. That's the conclusion of Conservative Chief Whip Lord Mancroft, who says it's too badly drafted to make it into law in its current form. The Hunting Trophies Import Prohibition Bill would stop anyone from bringing into the country hunting trophies from species deemed to be of conservation concern. It is supported by the government, Labour and the Liberal Democrats. It has already been approved by the House of Commons, but a group of peers has raised concerns and tabled amendments which threaten to derail the planned legislation. Swedish hunters have shot 120 bears on the opening day of the brown bear season. A total of 649 bears may be shot during the licensed hunt, which lasts until the 15th of October 2023, or until the quota is met. One area, Vermland, saw all but three bears of its quota met in one day. Hunting may be conducted from one hour before sunrise to two hours before sunset. This year is the first time that Swedes can hunt with dogs and hounds, which makes the hunt both faster and more efficient than before. The latest figure on how many bears there are in Sweden is from 2017, when the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency estimated the population at 2,900. Thanks to Per Holmseth for the story. 
The Royal Dutch Hunting Society is taking the Netherlands Agricultural Ministry to court over the hare hunting season. Three Dutch provinces stopped hare and rabbit hunting last season due to low numbers of the animals. However, hares are abundant and the ministry did not assess data on hare numbers from Dutch hunters. It only assessed research from the Dutch Mammal Society and a Dutch university. The court is expected to make a decision on the 11th of October 2023, four days before the official opening of the Dutch hare hunting season. Thanks to Eric van der Horst for the story. A powerful trades union in Australia is threatening industrial action over duck hunting. The Animal Justice Party wants to end duck hunting in the state of Victoria. However, the CFMEU, which represents more than 30,000 construction workers, says government sites could be targeted with industrial action if duck hunting were outlawed in the state. It says a survey of members found an overwhelming majority favoured keeping it in place. Thanks to Marco Wakim for the story. The US government is stripping more gun dealers of their licenses than ever before. The National Rifle Association has slammed Joe Biden for a backdoor violation of the Second Amendment after the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives revoked 122 gun dealer licenses since October. The figure is up from 90 for the previous year and 27 the year before that. The NRA says gun shops are in the front line in the war on gun smuggling. And finally, is the magic twig sporting? That's the question that carp anglers are asking. Angling TV host Ali Hamidi developed and is promoting a product that hooks up a carp without the angler on the bank even knowing it's happened. When the fish takes the bait, it triggers a spring further up the line that sets the hook in the fish's mouth. The Times newspaper reports that some waters have banned the device because it takes away part of the skill of carp angling. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And if you click like below this film on YouTube, David promises to shave next week. Thank you. I am off with Paul Childerley, Jeff Garrett and our Field Sports Nation winner Trevor Knowles to the 410 Championship on Monday. There are still places at the competition, which takes place at EJ Churchill in Buckinghamshire. Every entrance to the clay competition goes into a free draw for a peg on a 150 bird driven partridge 410 day in Cambridgeshire on Tuesday the 19th of September or another day to suit. Details on how to enter the clay competition below. Next, I am out on Dartmoor with Tom Davis looking for fallow bucks for his venison business. As Tom Davis steers his knacker wagon into a field in preparation for an evening's stalking, he's thinking about his commute and what the traffic is like. Summer holidays now, it's, uh, yeah, the lanes. That's the worst thing, is all the holidaymakers that come down in their nice shiny cars, nice tight lanes, and they can't reverse. <laughs> Tripper pressure is especially bad where we are on Dartmoor, where urban campaigners have been battling for wild camping rights in the courts. The headlines are misleading. You can't camp anywhere. Walkers, campers, it can be, well, it can be a bit scary, in all fairness. You'd be stalking deer and all of a sudden you come across someone. You've, you know, I've had times where you've shot a perfectly safe deer and then Minutes later, someone walks past 10, 20 metres away from you and you think, you know, you shouldn't be here, where have you just come from? So it can be quite scary, um, which also you've got, to, thermal's a big help with that. You've always got to scan around, you know, especially these dark areas, you know, people are anywhere these days. I've had two occasions, people camping, the thermal picked that up. <laughs> um, it was weird to start with, couldn't make out what it was. And yeah, as it got a bit closer, you could see it was actually people asleep in the tent early in the morning. They, they believe that the countryside is free to roam wherever they like, but actually a lot of it's privately owned and they don't realise that. They just think everywhere is common. You know, they'll see a bit of woodland and they think, well, no one uses that, I'll just camp in there. Um, so I just quickly picked up a deer moving through the cover down there, but it was travelling through. So I um, put the rifle straight on the sticks because we're in woodland. There wouldn't have been much time for me to ID with the binos and then straight onto the rifle sort of thing. So I set the stick straight away, um, but it was a doe. But I didn't see any of us with it. So it's just traveling through on her own. She probably got me, could be, have a late uh, fawn down there somewhere maybe. 
Tom picks up another animal, but it too is a doe. He's not short of fallow here, as the Pulsar merger thermal spotter reveals. Last chance, with just a few minutes to go, is a field next to open moorland. It's light enough for the good quality scope he has, but too dark for the camera. Ah, there's a herd in the woods, just looking to come out by those things. They do come out, but guess what? They're does. Once, twice, three times a lady. Back at the larder, Tom explains what went wrong. The place we went to last thing is normally Buck City. <laughs> but yeah, you don't normally see does there. If you do, it's rare. And we saw does. <laughs> there was a group of does mixed with some bucks, but it looks like they had come out before we got there and crossed our patch and gone over the fence line to next door. Is it the tourists at this time of year pushing the deer into becoming nocturnal? Certain areas, yeah. I have places that, um, which is known public areas, um, which is on an evening, it's kind of a waste of time even stalking because the deer would tend to come out way after dark. Um, so I do, do tend to just stalk those areas in the morning where there's no one around normally. The schools will soon be back and normality will return to our national parks, including Dartmoor. You can find Tom at his new Instagram address link below. A hacker stole his last one and Instagram won't give it back, though the hacker kindly said that Tom could have it for €350. Euros. For more about Pulsar in the UK, visit thomasjacks.co.uk. Thanks, Tom. Next, not for the faint of heart. I often get asked what happens when dangerous game fights back. Usually get asked it by the kind of aunties who think that deer ought to be armed. But it is a valid question, especially in India, which I visited earlier this year, where human-wildlife conflict has reached such a pitch that the government is now looking at changing its big predator management model from preservation to conservation. Rajiv Matthew deals with the aftermath of attacks by tigers, leopards and bears. He says what he sees. Rajiv Matthew has a difficult job. He has to clean up after predator attacks in India. Tigers, leopards and, he says, the worst one, sloth bear attacks. Either a sloth bear blunders into a human being or a human being blunders into a sloth bear, both of which end very badly for the person because um, leopards and tigers are basically meat eaters. So what they do is they bite and kill very cleanly and efficiently. Sloth bears do not do that. Sloth bears are diggers. They dig for their food, they dig for grubs, they dig for worms, they dig for ants. What they do is when they attack, their attack is a form of digging. So they dig into the person, so it's, it's a ghastly, gory uh, thing. And the, the problem with the bear attack, sloth bear attack, is that people survive. And they are scarred forever, f physically and emotionally, mentally and everything. Uh, it's very easy to tell between a tiger and a leopard. It's also very easy to tell if it's a cub or an adult. So you can actually make out the distances between the canines of a leopard is about four centimeters at best. And the puncture wounds are not very big. Whereas uh, in a tiger, the, uh, the canines are about three inches plus, that is 7.62 plus centimeters. If a tiger gets into the property and it becomes a man-eater, it doesn't fear anything or anyone, be it day or night. A leopard is not so. A leopard is very stealthy. It comes in by night and it picks up uh, people. How do you feel having to cope with these situations when you go and visit somebody who's had that problem? Mm, angry. And um, I also feel that it was an unnecessary death because uh, we are not doing what we should be doing. There are a lot of people who say that, yes, tigers should be saved and tigers, blah, 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 and they go on and on and on. But there is no solution to a problem. There was a time when I used to get nightmares every night. My wife used to wake up with me screaming and shouting. And I was always running away from a tiger or a leopard because I used to go and pick up uh, body parts of people. Now it has come down. We, we came from a time of paucity of uh, wild animals. Now we have uh, many, not as many as we would like to have, but we don't have the available habitats. Thanks, Rajiv. Whew, deep breath. Next up, we visit Shooting Sports UK and its new shop at Oakhead Shooting Ground in Staffordshire. Dan Bibb talks us through quirky 410s. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, Dan, some extraordinary looking for tens here. They're quirky. Are they also popular? Well, four tens really popular here, so they're not a lot of money whatsoever. Well, that one is the most usable as a pest control gun, and that's £175. We've got actually quite a nice little over and under here, and that one's only £150. So, yeah, I mean, people are going to come in and see these, and we can buy these on a whim without no thought. You know, it's not like buying a brand new Greta Silver Pigeon where you're going to give it a little bit of thought. Is it weird? Yep. <laughs> there's, uh, there's, no, there's no recoil, no sound. <laughs> Something like, like the bolt action. So oh. it's made by Norica. You fit one into the um, magazine. Sometimes they've got themselves you can fit two in. But the good thing about this one is it's got the Hush Power moderator. So Hush Power is a company in the UK and they convert and manufacture moderators for shotguns. So absolutely perfect for pest control where noise is going to be an issue. So yeah, they're um, really handy and for £175, it's not a lot of money. It's just nice to have, like we've just had a little bit of fun out on the ground with the uh, with this. Missed more than we've hit, but it's been some fun. So, which has yeah. been the most accurate out of all of them? I think the most accurate is probably the one which gives everyone the most familiar sight picture of a shotgun, which was the uh, which was the Falco. Obviously, it's an over and under. The sight picture's oh. more like what you'd see on your normal modern over and unders. It's a cool little feature, you know, it's, it's a folder, so, you know, stow it away. Double trigger, you, you break it by the lever at the front, fixed choke. I'll be surprised if that one lasts a week. Normally, we've got people saying, if you get one in, give me a call, and we've normally got a list. We get loads and loads and loads in like this, where people just have no use for them. But, again, still, we sell loads. As soon as they come in, they go out because it's worth about fifty pound. And um, it should be quite happy. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice little gun, and people will just walk in and uh, won't even think about the uh, won't even think about oh. the cost. So it's a nice little training aid, actually. So we keep we always keep something like this in stock. So plenty of options then for literally under two hundred and fifty quid. Yeah, for under two hundred pound, really. Yeah, well, that's me doing with four ten for today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan, and we'll have more from him in coming weeks. Now, from Kit to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up, this week, the Iguana Man switches his attention to feral pigeons, causing huge problems at a large cattle farm in Puerto Rico. The team shoot a good number but barely make a dent in the population, so they plan to return with air shotguns. With David Elliott Smith recuperating from his hip operation, his channel Predator Protection is featuring videos from his subscribers. This one is about decoying wood pigeons, not with a shotgun, but waiting until they land among the deeks and shooting them with an air rifle. Jaff from South Somerset Ferreters is also sitting in a pigeon hide and getting all misty-eyed as he shoots with his granddad's old side-by-side, -side, recalling some of his early shooting experiences. Here's another interesting gun from the Kentucky Ballistics Channel. This one's a massive punt gun with a bore of 1.68 inches. I think that makes it a one bore. There's lots of slow-motion shots showing its devastating effects on barrels of water. Over to Queensland, Australia, where Chris from the Huntsman Channel takes his friend Casey out to shoot his first red deer. Back in the UK, Simon Six PPC is called to deal with problem foxes on a sheep farm. He sets up on a stack of round bales, which he finds makes a perfect shooting rest. Here's the latest in the Triple C Odyssey series on the conservation benefits of hunting tourism. This one looks at the impact on elephant populations in Botswana. And finally this week, here's a very different sort of film about an extremely posh shoot at a chateau in France. The film is mostly about the history and tradition of the castle and preparations for the shoot lunch, with a segment on what looks exactly like a driven shoot here in the UK. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you, click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. And that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click the like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, 
Best of all, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7 pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.